Spirit of God upon our lives. We are desperate for that. We are wanting that. That's what this class period is all about. We're wanting to experience the very essence of God coming to our life. He has promised to do that, you know. And of course, we're calling it Provenient Grace. Um, it's a title that gives us the idea that God has moved out in our behalf and that we have not come after Him, that's for sure. And if we are moving after Him, it, you can be sure it's because He is drawing us and bringing us unto Himself. And the very desires we have for God have all been stimulated by the divine God Himself. And He has taken the initiative and He has moved out and He has sought after us and He has desired us and He has wanted us and He has loved us. See, you never can come to God and say, I love you. You always have to come to God and say, I love you too. Because he always said it first. See, he beat us to it. There's no question about it. And the only reason we have any desire for God or have any love towards God at all is because God has loved us. It's the wonder of provenient grace. We are going to spend this whole class period just focusing on provenient grace. I want to be sure that it's crystal clear in your mind and your heart. I cannot tell you how important this is. I cannot tell you how definitely if, as a, if a foundation that upon all holiness rests upon this. I cannot tell you. I cannot stress enough. I cannot overstress the emphasis that prevenient grace is an absolute essential concept. You must understand it. You must grasp it. You must rejoice in it. You must, you must lay, lean back on it. You must know that God is always taking the initiative in behalf of your life. See, when you understand that God has loved you so much, that He has moved out in your direction, that He is constantly coming after you, then it's not a hide-and-seek game. It's not, well, God is hiding and I have to seek Him and He won't let me find Him and I don't know where He is and I just don't... I want the will of God, but I can't find the will of God and I want to do it, but I don't know what it is. This provenient grace begins to be a fundamental concept that teaches you you cannot miss it. See, if you want the will of God, if you desire the will, you cannot miss it. See, God is coming after you. God is literally revealing Himself to you. God is literally forcing Himself upon you. Yes, you have a free will. Yes, you have a choice. That in itself is a result of provenient grace. But see, God is coming after you. He's revealing Himself. He's standing in your pathway. He will not let you miss Him. There is no man, any place, anywhere, who's going to miss the truth. No one will come and say, well, I didn't know. Everybody is without excuse. And the reason is provenient grace. The provenient grace of God. Wow. What a concept. You've got to grasp this. This has got to be so dominant in your thought process and so crystal clear in your thinking that as you come to the scriptures, you see it leaping out constantly. It begins to flow to you. You begin to recognize it for what it is. And instead of glossing over the passages and instead of it being a hidden concept, and misinterpreting the scriptures, this begins to help you understand what, what is taking place in terms of the heart of God. Now, we're going to do some review, of course, because this is so important. You've got to get a foundation. You've got to think these things through. Of course, the foundation for the whole thing is none other than the nature of God. See, this is a holiness concept. Where else could provenient grace come but from the nature of God? God is love. God is holiness. Hey, this is the internal fiber of his being. This is the makeup of his system. This is the thread that literally weaves its way through all the character and internalness of God. This is what determines his perspective. This is the, what determines his action, everything he does, everything he thinks. His whole outspill of his life is fundamentally based upon this business of holiness. God is holy. God is love. Now we understand that it's unconditional love. It's love without restraint, love without, without an angle, love without stimuli. See, God does not have a need, and because He has a need, He begins to move out in love. No, we settle that issue. God simply is love, and because He has love, and has decided to love you in His own heart and mind, that literally has created His need for you.
So God doesn't need and then He loves. God loves and then He needs. So this is not based upon you and who you are and what you do. This is based upon Him and who He is and what He wants to do. Because His inside heart says, I have to do this. His insides begin to demand it. The very flow of His inner life stimulates Him in this direction. It is the natural, spontaneous element of the life of God that literally drives Him to this. So you can see how pervenient grace is a natural. It just naturally spills out of this overwhelming, driving, passionate love that God has. He cannot help himself. He has to move out in your behalf. Now we discovered this in our study in 1 John chapter 4. We discovered that God is love and because of this being state of the love of God, God had to act. He could not help himself. So he manifested himself and the manifestation of God is Jesus. Jesus is the insides of God running around. Jesus is the great statement of the prevenient grace of God. See, every time you look at Jesus, you think, oh, prevenient grace. God has moved out on my behalf. I didn't ask him. He came after me. I didn't want him. He wanted me. I didn't love him. He loved, he loved me. I love him because he first loved me. He is stimulated within me. And it's all in the person of Jesus Christ. So Jesus is the epitome of prevenient grace. So we're talking about an action of the very nature of God. Prevenient grace is the very, very offspring of who God is. So prevenient grace flows from the very heartbeat of God himself. He could not help but have prevenient grace. Now, again, we're not going to fight over terms. If you don't like the term, that's fine. It is a theological term. It is not a biblical term. Provenient is not found in the scriptures, but it's a biblical concept. So it's a, the it's a theological term which, uh, uh, which has labeled this whole essence of God coming after us prevenient grace. If you want to call it something else, that's okay. But of course, in theological terms and theological realms, it will be confusing. People won't know what you're talking about. So we're calling it and referring to it as prevenient grace. Again, it is the natural outflow of the nature of God. The passionate heart of God had to respond in this manner. And his response to his heart and to his love is provenient grace. He has moved out in our behalf. So this is the love of God expressed. Provenient grace. What an amazing, amazing concept. Now again, it's all based then on the nature of God himself. Now you really see the strength of provenient grace when you see it against the backdrop of the iniquity, the depravity of mankind. When you see the awfulness of the fall, when you see the terribleness of the depravity in which man could have and did enter into, you begin to understand the wonder of the provenient grace. See, this was not a lovey-dovey. This was not a, oh, you'll help me. This is not, oh, you're so lovely, I can't help but love you. This was not some chemical attraction. This was man was repulsing. Man was repulsive. Man was, was degraded. Man had nothing in him that would attract God to him. There would be nothing about man's heart and mind now in the fall that God would say, oh, I love him. It's that the heart and mind of God could not tolerate, could not turn loose, could not allow. Hey, his redemptive nature would not allow it to happen. He had to intervene. So man has entered into the fall. While we were yet in our sins, Christ died for us. Pervenient grace, man. Pervenient grace. And when you see the love of God, pervenient grace love, over against the backdrop of how evil we are, how, how filthy, the, the raw sewage of our iniquity flowing through our very mind and inner heart, entering into the very essence of our bloodstream, you begin to understand the depth 
of the love of God, more of the depth of the pervenient love, how driven he really was and how significant this whole thing is. So we've been trying to, we've been trying to examine the whole business of the fall of man. Genesis chapter 3. Let's go back to our chart. Hey, the line comes down. Arrows are pointing downward. Fall. We've labeled it. The fall. Hey, man has fallen. What did he fall into? Bottom line, total depravity. Capital letters. Again, philosophical concept. Nobody's ever been there. Hey, that is a paper man. Hey, that is to help us understand what would have happened if provenient grace had not taken place. Hey, the scriptures does not, d does not divide this up for us. Hey, we see provenient grace in moving through the life of man, stopping man at total depravity, small letters. So the total depravity, small letters, is the severity of what the scripture is talking about. This total depravity, capital letters, hey, is not found. But again, it's a philosophical concept, and it gives us a handle on, it helps us approach and under, gives us a better understanding of where we could have been and what God has done in our lives and what this total depravity really is that we're dealing with. Total depravity, small letters. Now the difference between them has to do, you remember, with how the word total relates to the word depravity. So the total depravity, capital letters, is very severe. It's absolute depravity. It's man absolutely depraved. He cannot think a good thought. He cannot do a good deed. He cannot have a, a love relationship. He's incapable of making choices. He cannot see the difference between right and wrong. His conscience is gone. He is an animal driven by his lust and his passions. Hey, he had, lives out of his body instincts. The image of God is absolutely removed from his life. Now again, nobody's ever been there. You can't relate that to the devil because he never had the image of God in the first place. So the demonic forces aren't in on this and you can't compare that to this. Hey, nobody has ever been there. You can't even relate this to the guy in hell because even there in hell, he is related to the person of Jesus Christ because hell has its relationship, has its proximity in relationship to the person of Jesus Christ. And what's going to make hell, hell is the fact of what I could have been, what I could have seen, what I could have known, on what could have been mine and a sense of the presence. Now again, that's a philosophical concept. If you don't agree with that, don't get uptight about it. Hey, nobody cares. What we're trying to discover is the depth of this thing. How deep, deep the total depravity is gone. How wicked at the very core of our lives. How we would have no chance at all, man. No chance at all. There would, no, there would be no way to crawl out of this. There would be no rescue coming our way. We would be totally, absolutely depraved. There would be no desires for God. No capacity for love. No capacity to respond to God. We would be totally, absolutely depraved without any kind of hope, without any kind of desire at all. God intervened in our lives. We didn't ask Him to, man. We didn't beg Him to. God, inter get this, God intervened in our lives. Can you imagine the wonder of that? Man, you just ought to sit for the next 50 years and just contemplate and rejoice and praise. and Raise your hand. You ought to run the aisles, brother. Hey, you ought to be, whoa, life, regardless of what's happening or how bad you think things are. Man, regardless of the pressure that's on your life, this ought to elevate you to heights of rejoicing. This ought to literally, this literally, literally ought to boil within your system that God has literally moved out in your direction in the awfulness of what you could have been in the filth of where you are in the, in, the, in the terribleness of the sin depravity of your very being God has distinctly intervened in your life 
And I'm not talking about masses of people. I'm not talking about, oh, he sat on his throne and, and wrote out an edict and said, yeah, 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 I can do that for him, no big deal. Hey, I'm talking at great sacrifice. I'm talking about the giving of his own son. I'm talking about the risking of his own life. I'm talking about the long pattern of an Old Testament coming into the fullness of time, literally bringing about a cross. I'm talking about the essence of God laying his life on the line for you to bring about pervenient grace. See, pervenient grace was not cheap because it's all tied up with the redemptive process and the whole sacrifice of Christ and the whole business of him paying the penalty for your sin is the, a, a byproduct of that is this pervenient grace. So don't think for one single moment this was just a cheap deal. This was just, oh, in the mind of God. He said, yeah, I can love you. Well, yeah, hey, no big deal. Yeah, we are not his pet project. We are, we are not some sideline with him. Do you understand? This is not a charitable thing. This is not, oh, yeah, I can give a few bucks to that because, hey, I'm loaded anyhow. This is not that kind of deal. This costs God at the very essence of his heart. This ripped him right up the middle. This, this, this literally cut him right down the middle of his insides. See, this really cost God. Severely cost him because it's all wrapped up in the sacrifice of Christ himself. So pervenient grace is, is significant. God has intervened in your life. Now, he has stopped us then at total depravity, small letters. And that means that we are in the position where, oh, the image of God has been scarred, but it's still there. All that God had stamped within us, all of himself that he had that he had put within us is still there. It's, it's marred, yes. It's, it's hidden often, but it's, it's there. It's working in our lives. We have the, the ability of reasonableness. We have the capacity of love. We can have relationships. We can care about each other. We can have families. We can have family scenes. We have longings to be loved. We have desires for community. Hey, all of that is provenient grace. We can think a good thought. Now, hey, even our good thoughts have been infiltrated with sin, but man, the very fact of being able to express a good thought. Hey, the very ability of having relationships. Hey, hey the, very, the very means of having desires for God. The ability to see right and wrong. The very essence of choice itself. Hey, I could do the right. I don't have to do the wrong. The very essence of choice, the ability to respond to God, all of that has been restored in our lives by the provenient grace of God. And the reason we can still be human beings, walk as a man, as a woman, the reason we're not animal level, man, the reason we're not driven by our body lust, the reason we're not driven by our instincts is because of this amazing, amazing provenient grace of God. He has intervene in our behalf. And lo and behold, we are a people, think of it man, we are a people who have been rescued by God and we have get, been given a second chance and the basis of the second chance is this provenient grace. Do not underestimate the wonder of the provenient grace. Do I not underestimate the immensity of the grace of God that has come in your behalf? Hey, grasp it. Understand it. Again, sit for the next 50 years and just rejoice in it. Let your whole life be permeated by it. Hey, and see it everywhere you go in the scriptures. Understand it from the depth of the heart of God. God has distinctly moved out in your direction. Pervenient grace. Hey, total depravity, small letters. God has given us a second chance. Now this second chance, of course, based upon provenient grace, is fundamental to Christian thought. Uh, hey, the reason we're going to be able to respond to God is because of this provenient grace. 
and God is going to continue to move upon our lives. The interesting thing about the whole business of provenient grace is the fact that it is progressive and we want to spend some time talking about the progressive element of the provenient grace. See, he doesn't dump it on you all at one time. No, he gives you segments of it. He gives you bits of it. He, people walk in it. It's like the lights on your car. The more you respond to it, the more you get of it. And it can take you all the way to where you want to go if you will just follow it. So provenient grace is in a constant progression. People don't take gigantic steps towards God. They inch their way towards God. Look how long it took you to respond to God. But it was all about the drawing and the stimulating of provenient grace upon your life. So we want to spend some time today trying to nail down, trying to define, trying to get a handle on, really coming to grips with the whole business of provenient grace. Now, we've re let me remind you again that provenient grace comes from the word, that is the word preventing, comes from the word provenient. You'll see it right at the heart of it. The beginning of the whole thing is preventing. Provenient grace, preventing love. So what we're really dealing with is the preventing love of God. God preventing us from being in total depravity, capital letters, and stopping us in total depravity, small letters. God preventing us to going from going to the bottom. Hey, the, the bottom line. God preventing us from being in the state of absolute loss of the image of God. So, provenient grace, preventing love. You'll remember that the word provenient means going before. And again, the word grace is another word for love. So, provenient grace is the love of God that goes before. And what is this love of God that goes before? Well, it is all the love of God that comes to your life before you get saved. So, you understand that all the way before redemption and all of the initial sanctification that we're going to get into and talk about, you will discover that there is this provenient grace. In fact, what brings us to the crisis moment of entire sanctif uh, of initial sanctification, what brings us to the salvation experience is provenient grace. God is drawing us. God is wooing us. And all of that wooing and all of that drawing of a divine God prior to the actual conversion experience, we label it provenient grace. Now the truth of the matter is it gets all complicated. That is, it gets all messed up. It gets hard to dissect up. Say, oh, this is provenient grace. This is not. Because, again, it's the love of God that's coming to our life. And as we spill into salvation experience and move on to the growth and the discipleship of the whole thing, we continue to experience the love of God, which, again, is the same thing as the provenient grace. Only in theological terms, we slice it off at this business of initial sanctification or or salvation. So we're looking at all that God is doing prior to our response to Him. In other words, prior to confession of sins, repentance, and the new birth experience, prior to that, God is acting upon our life. This, of course, involves conviction of sin. This, of course, involves the awakening. Wesley called it, John Wesley called it, an awakening. There is a a something going on within me that seemingly wasn't there before. Hey, I've got a new home. I've, I, I've got a new boat. I've, I've got a new car. I, my family's doing well. The kids are fine. Uh, hey, I love my job. Uh, everything's just the way, good health. Uh, everything's just the way it ought to be. Hey, couldn't be better. Life is good. Life is good. And all of a sudden, there is a restlessness going on inside of me. Hey, the house, we, you know, we really don't have enough room. We need to add on to the back. Yeah, and I've only got a three-car garage. You know, I really need a fourth, a fourth, I need a fourth car, a four-car garage. Yeah, you know, the boat is, it, well, it's really not big enough. And there is this restlessness. Something isn't right. There was a vacuum inside. I'm becoming deeply aware of this vacuum. Th things aren't quite adding up the way they ought to. Thing, I'm not satisfied. The materialism isn't pleasing me anymore. The job, it's okay, but it's not really challenging and I'm finding a lack in my life. 
How, why am I sensing all of this? What's, what's going on? Provenient grace, brother. Provenient grace. God is moving. And Wesley called this an awakening. There is a deep internal stirring and a new awareness of what is taking place, that things aren't the way they ought to be, and something is missing in my life. And, and I, I began to go on a search. What could it be? Where can I go? How can I find the answer? See, there's this provenient grace that is bringing me this awareness. See, provenient grace stimulated this. See, you, you didn't sit down and calculate this out. See, you didn't sit down and get a piece of paper and over here write your assets and, oh, how, how good life is and write all, all good health and boat and house and da-da-da and you got it all down here and over here, well, what, this is what I'm missing and begin to evaluate and say, you know, my life really isn't adding up. No, you didn't do that. See, that wasn't out of your mind. See, you'd have gone right on with the boat, right on with the house, right on with the, right on with the job. You'd have been, hey, you'd have stimulated yourself right on with your hobby, right on with you. You'd have sought your own way. But God is arresting you. God is creating hungers within you. And you are beginning to have desires for Him. And those desires are all coming because of pervenient grace. Now understand that everybody, every place, under all circumstances has that. That nobody is void of the provenient grace of God. That every person who's ever been born in every single generation, in every culture, Christian and non-Christian, everywhere, regardless, has this internal hunger going on. That God has planted that within every single individual. Hey, if you don't want to accept the biblical concept of this, uh, you can go to, secu to the secular world. Hey, the sociologists tell us that they've never found a tribe, never found a group of people, any place, anywhere, under any circumstances, that hasn't had some kind of form of worship. That every people, oh, every civilization, every tribe, every culture, man, hey, the ones that are most remote, the ones who've never heard of Christianity, everybody, they've never, think of this, they've never ever found a group of people that didn't have a form of worship of a higher being that implanted within us, oh, man, oh, man, Implanted within us. Do you get it? Implanted within us is the very desire for something bigger than ourselves. That there is an awareness within us that beyond us there is something greater than we are. That there is someone bigger than we are in charge. That there is, there is God, man. There is God. Oh, you've heard me say before, no doubt, that it takes at least four or five good generations of Christianity to produce one atheist. Hey, you don't find atheists, man, in, in, in the jungles of Africa. Come on, you don't find atheists in the bush country of Africa. You, you don't find atheists, man, in the inner parts of China, man. You, hey, where, where paganism, where ungodliness flows, hey, you, you, don't, find, you don't find atheism there. See, you, you got to have five generations of good Christianity before we become sloppy and content and all wrapped up in ourselves. And then we can get cocky and say, Psst, ah, there isn't even a God. Nah, there isn't a God. See, outside of Christianity, everybody believes in God, man. Because there is this inner hunger, there is this inner drive that, that has to be squelched before you can become an atheist. See, th th this drive, this, it's been put there by God, man. It's provenient grace. We are driven with this. So this is the love of God that's come to us. And He has stimulated within us a desire for Himself. And that desire for Himself is the business of provenient grace. Hey, everybody, every place, everywhere, under all circumstances, and every generation has that planted within him. God is drawing mankind to himself. And I want you to understand that it's not just that God has taken an element, oh, this is provenient grace. Yeah, I've got uh, one, I got a one made, it's like a, like a, like a small tumor. I've got one made for every human being and I just implant it and it'll work on him. No, it's him, man. It is him. He himself is drawing us. 
It is the immensity of the Holy Spirit, the essence of the Spirit of Christ that has come Himself and He Himself is affecting us and drawing us to Himself. And provenient grace is a result of His person. It isn't something He gives to us. It's that which He is within us. So everybody has, not to the point of salvation, but everybody has the essence of the presence, man. The essence of the presence of God. Provenient grace comes from His person. So provenient grace is all the love of God that comes to our life before we get saved. We see it in, in the fact that that we desire him. See, we we did not you can't stand up in church and say, Oh, I sought God and found him, isn't he lucky? <laughs> you have to stand up in church and weep and say, Woo, thank you, Jesus, he came after me. Man, he came after me. And he sought me and found me. See, I didn't find him, he found me. I didn't seek him. He sought me. And man, if you ever make it to heaven, you will finally get there and say, Whoa! It was Jesus all the way. It was Jesus all the way. And any indication in my voice, any indication in my attitude, any indication in my communication that I added to this, that I, well, God was lucky to get me, that I, well, after all, I really... Uh, I, 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 I really went after this. I really pulled this off. I, hey, any indication of that is blasphemy, man. It's a slap in the face of God. Hey, there is none of that going on. Why, provenient grace settled that, brother. I'd be flat on my face. The image of God removed. No chance at all. If God hadn't intervened and God hadn't drawn me, man, I'd have gone astray a thousand different times and missed it. Do you know how close I was to missing it, man? Hey, if the right person at the right time hadn't done the right thing at the right moment, hadn't, if he hadn't said the right thing, I'd have been gone. God timed it. God intervened. God came. God brought his provenient grace to my life. God wrapped his arm around me. God hounded me. One man called him the hound of heaven. It's an old time poem. You ought to find it and read it sometime. Oh, and in the poem he says, Oh, I can feel his panting breath on my neck. I can, feel, I can hear his pounding feet. God is after me. God is after me. He's hounding me down. He's the hound of heaven. Won't leave me alone. Pesters the living daylights out of me. Provenient grace. God is so strong on this that he literally has stuck his fingers in the middle of your history and manipulated the scenes of your life. That God is strategizing, constantly planning how he's going to use this, how he's going to use that. He's stripping you down. He's bringing you to himself. He is standing in your pathway. He's bringing revelation to you. Oh, do you understand the strength of that? Oh, how overwhelming that is. God has stuck his fingers in the middle of your life. If anybody, any place would look over the past year of their life and just analyze the circumstances and what has happened to them and what's going on and what they've faced and what they've been involved in, they, they would say when they got down, you know, God, God was stripping me down, man. God was revealing himself to me. God was speaking to me through that. The reason God allowed that to happen in my life was to drive me against the wall so that I could see him. I, I never would have got out of that comfort. I never would have got out of that, uh, out, out of that pattern. I, I never would have got, gotten to the place where I, I could have seen the glory of his face. If, if that hadn't happened, God used that in provenient grace. He's been manipulating the circumstances of my life. Uh, for instance, uh, hey, a, a man gets up on, on Sunday morning and says, well, you know, it's a beautiful day, sun is shining. Hey, let's go for a drive. He gets in his car, man, with his family and, and heads down the road and they're looking at the scenery or whatever and lo and behold, oh no, a flat tire. Can you believe it, man? A flat tire. What a deal. A flat tire. So, hey, he gets out, goes to the trunk. Oh no, the spare is flat too. Hey, or no spare at all. Oh, forevermore. Forgot all about it. 
about it. Good night. Now what am I going to do? Well, I need to get to a telephone. Hey, he sees a church building across the street. Hey, he goes over to the church building and, 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 and they're having church in there. And he goes in, you know, it's Sunday morning. He goes in and, 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 and he borrows the phone. Yeah, I got a flat tire. I need some help. And he borrows the phone, calls a friend of his. Would you come and get me? And, and yeah, help me out here. And yeah, yeah, you got a tire. That's like, okay, bring it over. So he calls him on the phone, man. Well, he's got to wait, of course. And so he's hanging around the foyer and finally he's invited. Well, why don't you sit back here? He comes and sits on the back row and man, the preacher begins to preach. The songs are sung. The preacher begins to preach and the message of God comes through loud and clear and while he's sitting on that back row, man, he gets under terrible conviction. God moves upon his heart and his mind. The message gets through to him. The word of God penetrates his life and hey, the altar call is given and next thing he knows, man, he's walking down the aisle and kneels in an altar of prayer and, and he gets gloriously saved and, 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 and it's, it's a wonderful experience. His life is changed forever and before he gets done, he wins his family to God and Whew, you say, wow, wasn't he lucky he had a flat tire? <laughs> wow, wasn't that a lucky thing, man? Come on, this wasn't about luck. Don't you understand? God stuck his fingers in the middle of the circumstances of the man. He didn't accidentally drive down the street. He didn't accidentally have a flat tire. He didn't accidentally ha have a flat tire in front of the church. He didn't accidentally have it right during the time when the message was given. He didn't accidentally, come on, this was not God. God has intervened in his life. Pervenient grace. God intervening in his life. Hey, you want to take your life and analyze it under that kind of microscope? Do you want to see how God has been plotting and planning, moving, strateg strategizing, strategically setting up plans? Hey, I, I all want it. hey, if you could see, you see what would happen to your life if you'd see everything in light of that? Oh. Hey, this would not be, oh, brother, wipes me out. Hey, no, this would be, whoa, God, why did you allow that? What are you going to teach me? Where are you going to take me? How are you going to reveal yourself to me? What's going to happen in my life now? Hey, and everything would be the movement of God to bring you to where he's desiring you. See, th that's, that's the concept of pervenient grace. That God is acting in your behalf, man. And the scriptures constantly are revealing this. That, that we didn't seek Him. He, he sought us. Now, of course, the ramifications of this kind of concept are just, are just overwhelming. See, there's, there's, it's just, it, it just affects everything. See, once you grasp this concept, this, this affects the way you approach every, everything else in Christianity. Again, we mentioned to you in last class, period about the whole business of repentance. And we're going to talk about it a lot because th this is really key. You've got to understand this. Man, you've got to get this down. Hey, the business of repentance. See, it, this changes your whole view of repentance. Uh, somebody comes up to me and says, you believe in earning the right to be saved. And I, I say, what are you talking about? No, you believe in earning your salvation. <laughs> no, I don't believe in earning my salvation. We are saved by grace through faith, not of ourselves, lest any man should boast. Ephesians chapter 2. Hey, we're saved by grace, man, not by works. So it's, no, I don't believe in earning your salvation. Yes, you do. I heard you preach the other night. What did you preach on? Repent! Repent! You yelled it and screamed it. Repent! You spit and fumed. Repent! And if you will repent, God will save you. Hey, somebody got up out of the seat, man. They walked down the aisle. They knelt in an altar of prayer. They shed tears. They confessed their sin. And then because they did that, they did the works of repentance, God said, well, okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. Uh, yeah, I'll, I guess I'll save you now. Yeah, you've earned the right to be saved. And because I repented and did the works of repentance, I was able to be saved, I earned the right to be saved. But see, pervenient grace blows that whole thing out of the water, man. There is no, not even the slightest indication of that in repentance, man. That, that, oh no, that, that's not true. That cannot be. Why? Pervenient grace. See, if you come through the eyes of pervenient grace, it clears all that up. Again, as we said before, when do you repent? You don't repent just any time you want to. You don't make an appointment with God 
10 years down the road. You don't say, well, I'll have my fling do my thing, sow my wild oats, then later I'll repent. Hey, you don't repent just any time you want to, son. When do you repent? Hey, God moves up on your life, brother, and, and, and you repent because it's a response to the activity and the movement, the prevenient grace of God on your life. See, you don't, you don't just decide to repent. It's not something you do. It's a response that you have to the Almighty God. And unless God draws you, you don't repent. Unless God comes, you don't know guilt. Unless God comes, you don't see things as they are. Unless God comes, you waller in your iniquity. Unless God comes and awakens you, man, and it's in that awakening that He enables you to respond by repentance. And repentance is not something you do to get God to move. Repentance is a response to the movement of God upon your life. So you don't repent and God moves. No, God moves and you repent. So repentance is not a works you do. It is a response to the Almighty God and the stimulation of, him, of His own presence in your life as He draws you to Himself. Now we talked about belief in the same way. Well, I just, I just can't believe. That's not true because belief is not something you do. Well, well, I just can't, I just can't see it. Well, that, that's not true because it isn't about you thinking it through. It isn't about you clarifying it, finding all the pros and cons, uh, working your way through the details. It isn't about that at all. See, belief is not some kind of mental calculation. Belief is not some kind of, well, I just decided to believe and I'm just pushing everything else aside and, hey, I won't, I won't doubt anymore and I'll just focus. No, it's not about, see, that's all about you and this, that's not what's going on. Provenient grace says, hey, man, you, you don't just believe and then God moves upon your life. See, you don't just calculate it all out and then God comes along as a result of that. See, faith and belief is not something that's a product of you, a, a works that you accomplish. Place. No, prevenient grace clar clarifies all that. See, God moves upon your life, man, and, and you respond by, by belief. Belief is a, a product of the movement of God himself. So God moves upon your life and you respond by belief. You don't believe and then God moves. God moves and then you believe. So see, prevenient grace, man, becomes, becomes the lens that literally affects all of this. Everywhere you go, see, it, it permeates, it changes your whole view of everything. It brings Christianity into a whole new biblical perspective when you see it through the eyes of prevenient grace. God has acted in your behalf and there he has acted first. He has taken the initiative before you ever wanted him. He wanted you and has stimulated within you your desire to want him. And that affects your whole biblical theology. See, holiness rests upon this concept. So you've got to understand this. Can you imagine a guy stomping right up into heaven and man, when he gets to heaven, he begins to look around and says, uh, Hey, uh, St. Peter, I have a right to come to heaven, man. I have a right to be in heaven. Yes, sir, I, I, I should come to heaven. And St. Peter looks at him and says, Well, hey, uh, lay it on me, man. Yeah, what's the deal? Why do you think you have a right to come to heaven? Oh, because of, and he begins to list all the good things he did. Hey, because of, I went to church every Sunday, had my devotions. Yeah, I prayed before my meals. Yeah, I was uh, a charitable in my deeds. Yeah, honest person. And he just, and he lists all of his goodness. Can you imagine the nerve of that? Even the thought process of that. Even if we don't go to heaven and say that, can you imagine the nerve of that thought process? And I've had people express that to me. Hey, well, if anybody ever goes to heaven, it'll be him. Why, he was such a good man. Yeah, so honest. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Like everything he did, uh, anything he did would give him the, don't, don't you want to see prevenient grace says, hey, man, you, you missed the concept. See, you don't understand what's going on. The height, get this, the height of all sin is stomping into the presence of God, looking Him right in the eye and saying, Hey, I've been good. I've been good. Claiming to yourself goodness. Thinking that you are the source of goodness. 
thinking that the reason you are the way you are, the reason you pay your bills, the reason you have a lovely family, the reason you have good relationships, the reason you went to church, the re is because you, 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 you produced that. That's the greatest slap in the face of God. I mean, that's a knife in his back. That's a stab in his chest, brother. When all the time, the only goodness that's ever come to your life has been because of Him. And the only reason you have any love relationship is because of Him. And the only reason you had any desire to go to church is because of Him. You know how much God loves you? He gets you to come to church when you don't even want to. Hey, He loves you. He pesters you. He moved you. Hey, and the only reason you had your devotions and the only reason you got into the book and the only reason you did anything that had any smack of, of, of righteousness about it at all is because of this divine action of God himself, man. God has moved upon your life. And the height of sin, brother, is to slap God right in the face by saying, hey, I've been, I've been, I've been, as if you were the source of it when all of this has spilled out of the prevenient grace of God. And the only way to approach God, brother, is flat on your face saying, whoa, oh God, it was you, it is you, hey, it is you. If there's anything about me that's any has any desirability at all. It's because of you, God. It's because of you. So you see, we must spend the rest of our lives praising and glorifying and pointing to and it's Jesus, it's Jesus, it's Jesus. This is not about us and why do we pat each other on the back and why do we claim, oh, you're so great and oh, you're so good and oh, you are, when all the time it is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus and more of Jesus. Take him out of the equation, man <laughs> and we end up being zero all the way. There's only one possibility for any kind of righteousness at all and it's this Jesus we must we must come back to acknowledging him so he is responsible and it's called prevenient grace now, the tone of the scriptures gives you this. Everywhere you go in the scriptures, and we're going to spend a whole class period just analyzing the Word of God, but, but the tone of the scriptures, I just want to talk to you a moment about the tone of the scriptures just, just indicates this. Where, where did this whole business of, uh, where, where did the whole business of redemption come from? How did it all start? Man entered, entered into the fall. Oh, we read it. Yeah, we read it back in Genesis chapter 3. Man entered, entered into the fall. Man, man is under the judgment of God. The curse of sin is, is, is upon his life now. He's separated from the garden. Oh, it's terrible. Wh where did redemption come in? Who started that idea, man? Who came up with that plan? Did man sit down and calculate out and I'll do sacrifice offerings and, and I'll, I'll, I'll produce a generation and, and, and a remnant and, and I'll produce... Well, who came up with it? God did. You know the answer. God did. Hey, God's the one that came and gave the messianic promise. God said, here's what I'm going to do, man. Here's what I'm going to do. Hey, here's the action I'm going to take in relationship to this. So do you see that even the redemption thing, the whole redemption thing from the very beginning was not conceived in the mind of man. It was conceived in the heart of God. So, provenient grace, the tone, the tone of the whole scriptures. Do you, re you realize as the whole thing unfolded? Who, who was it? Who was it that came up with the, uh, uh, the covenant for Abraham? And who, who was it that came along and decided for a people to be born through which the Christ could come. Who, who, was, who was it that put that all together? <laughs> you know the answer. It was God. Hey, Ab Abram was walking along, minding his own business. And it was God who came down and tapped him on the shoulder and said, hey, I'm God, and revealed himself. Hey, it wasn't Abram. Abram didn't go on a search. Abram was content building little statues of pagan gods, selling them across the counter. They just built a new house. They were in the bridge club, man. And they had a club meeting that night. It was all, hey, he was happy, brother. But God came along and tapped him on the shoulder. Provenient grace, son. Provenient grace. Hey, God intervened in his life. See, everywhere you go in the scriptures, you come back to that. Hey, it's, it's the intent. It's the tone of the entirety of this book. 
uh, for instance, you see it in the Christmas story. In another class, we're studying the whole Christmas story, but what, what is it all about, brother? It's all about God is intervening. And man, God, this is God's plan. And as you see the whole story from Joseph's view, it, it's, it's God who's intervening and God directing and God sticking his fingers in the middle of and God is, is setting this up. This is God's deal. God has taken the initiative in this. Hey, Joseph would have divorced Mary and ended the whole thing and separated himself as far as he could from the whole business of what was going on. But God came in the angel of the Lord in the night hour and God gave him instruction. And God intervened. Listen, the Christ child would have been slaughtered with all the other two-year-old and younger boys. Hey, that would have taken care of that in Bethlehem and the surrounding districts. But hey, God intervened. God, God moved. God came. God took the initiative. God acted. See, the prevenient grace of God, man. This is all. Do you see the tone? The tone of the scriptures. You see it in Jesus in John chapter 4 uh, verse 4. You see this whole idea of, of the woman of the well. You remember the story. We don't have time to look at it, but the woman of the well and, and, and he's going to Samaria and the disciples are questioning about it but it, it, the scripture says that he, he needed to go the emphasis of the word is strong. That He had to go. He was compelled to go. Why? There was a woman down there he had to talk about, talk to, and a whole, a whole, a whole revival in Samaria that had to take place. He had to, there was this initiative, this drive, this, this, this thing within him. That's provenient grace. He has that towards you. Hey, he's moving in your direction. Oh, respond. Just, just respond to God. Just, just let him do what he wants to do. He is after you.